Welcome back to Polygamy, An Enemy Has Done This. I'm tracing the scriptural origins of marriage and polygamy with the intent to show how and why we should direct our faith to what God says about women and marriage. And we're now in the Book of Mormon, which Latter-day Saints like me consider to be another witness of Jesus Christ. We've seen the apostasy and destruction that polygamy and its umbrella sin idolatry have wrought among the ancient Israelites. And in my last video, I went through 1 Nephi and Jacob in the Book of Mormon and demonstrated through the scriptures in those books that God's message is absolutely consistent because God is unchanging. If the Lord wants a covenant people who can inherit the kingdom, he has to call them out of wicked environments and specifically command them to keep the commandment for a man to have one wife and no concubines. Otherwise, people try to justify themselves in abomination using the polygamous examples of David and Solomon. Today, we're looking at the story of Abinadi and King Noah, and we'll also briefly consider King Noah's priest Alma, who converted to Abinadi's message, repented of his sins and iniquities, and established the church of God among the people. And I'm going to be likening these scriptures to our own Latter-day Saint history and present predicament as a church which has a doctrine of many wives and concubines. Generally speaking, the account of Abinadi, King Noah, and Alma gives us really interesting insight into two issues. The first issue is important to the Jews, and that's the extent to which polygamy, and specifically polygyny, is allowed within the law of Moses. And the second issue is important to us Gentiles, and that is whether priesthood authority is revoked or can ever be restored if people break God's law of marriage and embrace the abominable practice of having many wives and concubines. So let's jump into the Book of Mormon and see what kind of man King Noah was. Noah was the son of Zenith, who was the first king of the Nephite colony in the land of Lehi-Nephi. The previous chapters in the Book of Mosiah tell Zenith's story, and I won't go over the whole thing, but I believe one detail right here in chapter 9, verse 1, is relevant. Zenith was part of a group that went to go reclaim the land they believed was their rightful inheritance from the Lamanites. But when Zenith went to go spy out the Lamanite forces, he saw that which was good among them and was desirous that they should not be destroyed. So Zenith was a compassionate man who wanted to believe the best about people. He looked for evidence of good and perhaps minimized evidence of bad. And this generosity of spirit sadly left him vulnerable to the cunning and craftiness of King Laman, who had made a treaty with Zenith with the intent to bring the Nephites into bondage. So it may have been his compassionate nature and desire to look for the good in others that led Zenith to confer the kingdom upon Noah. Parents aren't blind to their children's weaknesses, so perhaps Zenith didn't choose Noah to be the second king of the land because Noah was the best suited of his sons for the role, but rather he may have thought that the responsibilities of kingship would invite Noah to rise to his full potential. Sadly, that didn't happen, because not only did Noah not follow his father's example, but Noah did not keep the commandments of God and we are explicitly told how he violated the commandments. Noah did walk after the desires of his own heart, and the desires of King Noah's heart led him to have many wives and concubines, as has sadly been the case for powerful men throughout all of history. And you'll probably not be surprised that I'd like us to quickly contrast this with our polygamy document which became section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants in 1876, without the common consent of the church and in violation of the canonized law of the church. So while Mosiah chapter 11 verse 2 tells us that desiring and having many wives and concubines is a violation of God's commandments, the polygamy document says God justifies men in having many wives and concubines if men desire them. So, as we are consistently compelled to in our walk through scripture, we must choose our faith. If a man desires to have many wives and concubines, is he not keeping the commandments of God? Or is he justified? These scriptures teach opposite doctrine, 
so we cannot direct our faith to both of them. I'm going to go with the doctrine taught in the Book of Mormon, which tells me that King Noah did not keep the commandments of God because he had many wives and concubines, and his example and the system he established caused his people to, quote, commit sin and do that which was abominable in the sight of the Lord. Yea, and they did commit whoredoms and all manner of wickedness, end quote. I think these scriptures are really clear, but just notice the words that are associated with polygamy. Sin, abominable, whoredoms, and wickedness. In verse 3, we see that Noah taxed his people a percentage of all they possessed. Um, And I think many of us would really appreciate that tax rate, which tells you something about our awful state of affairs. Um, And he took this portion of the people's goods to support himself and his wives and his concubines, and also his priests and their wives and their concubines. Thus, King Noah changed the affairs of the kingdom. For he put down all the priests that had been consecrated by his father and consecrated new ones in their stead, such as were lifted up in the pride of their hearts, yea, and thus they were supported in their laziness and in their idolatry and in their whoredoms by the taxes which King Noah had put upon his people. And thus did the people labor exceedingly to support iniquity. Yea, and they also became idolatrous because they were deceived by the vain and flattering words of the king and priests, for they did speak flattering things unto them, end quote. I think verse 7 is extremely significant. We tend to think of idolatry as worshiping objects, like bowing down before a golden calf. But as Bishop Waddell just articulated in the October 2023 General Conference, idolatry is placing anything or anyone higher than God including teachings which are not in alignment with God. This is why polygamy is always accompanied by idolatry. Polygamy cannot be justified through God's works. For at the creation, God created one man and one woman and told those two to cleave together and be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Human life itself can only be created through the union of one man and one woman. At the flood, the only humans who were delivered were monogamously married, and the Lord established the covenant anew with them. And the ratio of males to females born into this world is roughly equal, with actually slightly more males born than females. So the only way you can justify polygamy is by prioritizing men's words over God's works. And we don't usually drill down into exactly what words, what things King Noah and his priests taught the people which deceived them, because it's uncomfortable given our own Latter-day Saint history. But if you apply the scriptures that we just read to verse 7, the people were deceived by believing that having many wives and concubines was not a sin. Having many wives and concubines is a sin every time. It is always against the commandments of God. King Noah and his priests may have told the people that this was the higher law, only reserved for the most righteous. Or they may have taught them that because they were the chosen people, God was asking them to make a special sacrifice, which would guarantee their exaltation. They may have taught both of these things and let the people themselves decide which one to believe, so long as they did believe in and partake of these abominable works. But whatever justifications King Noah and his priests all testified to, to get the people to accept a doctrine of many wives and concubines, the Book of Mormon teaches us that their testimonies didn't make it true. Their testimonies only witnessed that they believed it was true, and they were able to deceive the people into believing that as well. Besides using the taxes from the people to support himself and his wives and concubines and their priests and their wives and concubines, King Noah used the taxes from the people to build many elegant and spacious buildings that were noted for their fine craftsmanship and decadent ornamentation. And it came to pass that he placed his heart upon riches, and he spent his time in riotous living with his wives and his concubines, and so did also his priests spend their time with harlots. And it came to pass that he planted vineyards round about in the land, 
and he built wine presses and made wine in abundance. And therefore he became a wine bibber and also his people. The people sparred with the Lamanites, and after emerging victorious, they were, quote, lifted up in the pride of their hearts and did delight in blood and in the shedding of the blood of their brethren, and this because of the wickedness of their king and priests, end quote. It was at this time that a man named Abinadi came among them, prophesying, quote, Thus saith the Lord, and thus hath he commanded me, saying, Go forth and say unto this people, Thus saith the Lord, Woe be unto this people, for I have seen their abominations and their wickedness and their whoredoms, and except they repent, I will visit them in mine anger. End quote. As I've demonstrated in other videos, we see again here that the Lord doesn't breathe one syllable about authority when speaking of polygamy. It isn't abominable, wicked, and whoredoms unless it's authorized by a prophet. It's simply a sin, one which grows out of idolatry and is always accompanied by pride, greed, and violence. This teaching that there is no divine authority which can justify polygamy was actually one of the foundational doctrines of our church as well. Here is just one of many declarations which communicated this. In May 1842, an epistle was read to the Relief Society, which was signed by Hiram Smith, Joseph Smith, Heber C. Kimball, Wildred Richards, Vincent Knight, and Brigham Young. This epistle was in response to the secret polygamous teachings which were floating about, where some men said, quote, they have authority from Joseph or from the first presidency or any other presidency in the church, and thus, with a lie in their mouth, deceive and debauch the innocent under the assumption that they are authorized from these sources. May God forbid. Later in the epistle, we do not want anyone to believe anything is coming from us, contrary to the old established morals and virtues and scriptural laws. And interjecting here, they interpreted the old established morals and virtues and scriptural laws as no polygamy. That was the canonized doctrine of the church. Continuing, And all persons pretending to be authorized by us, or having any permit or sanction from us, are and will be liars and base impostors. And you are authorized, on the very first intimation of the kind, to denounce them as such, and shun them as the flying fiery serpent, whether they are prophets, seers, or revelators, patriarchs, twelve apostles, elders, priests, mayors, generals, city councillors, aldermen, marshals, police, lord mayors, or the devil, are alike culpable and shall be damned for such evil practices. And if you yourselves adhere to anything of the kind, you also shall be damned. Honestly, these words are hard to read because of our history, my ancestors' history. But this message could not be stronger or more clear. There's no authority for a man to have sexual relations with more than one woman. Now, were all of the men who signed that epistle living according to those teachings? It would appear the answer is no, which is very sad for whoever transgressed the law but they'll be held accountable to God for their transgressions, not me. I'm looking at the law, and I only look at men to judge their fruits, not their destiny. Later, we'll see what Abinadi says about prophets who fall into transgression. Abinadi's preaching went over as well as Enoch's did initially, and Noah's. The people found his assessment of their works offensive and were wroth. Because King Noah and his people were blinded, they hardened their hearts against the word of the Lord and would not repent. They wouldn't consider that they were wrong, and they wouldn't change, not only their works, but their minds. So the Lord delivered Abinadi out of their hands. After two years, the Lord commanded Abinadi to prophesy again to the people because they had not repented. They were angry at his prophecies and were especially offended that Abinadi would accuse King Noah of committing sin. So they took Abinadi and carried him bound before the king, who caused that Abinadi should be cast into prison. And he commanded that the priests should gather themselves together, that he might hold a council with them, what he should do with him. And the priests said to the king, Bring him hither that we may question him. 
And the king commanded that Abinadi should be brought before them. And they began to question him, that they might cross him, that thereby they might have wherewith to accuse him. But he answered them boldly, and withstood all their questions, yea, to their astonishment. For he did withstand them in all their questions, and did confound them in all their words. And here we come to that significant teaching in the Book of Mormon. It's the way the Book of Mormon presents the Law of Moses, specifically as it applies to polygyny, which is the specific term for a husband with multiple wives. Throughout the Book of Mormon, and most explicitly here in Abinadi's teachings to King Noah and his priests, the Law of Moses is presented as strictly forbidding polygyny. Here, Abinadi answers the priest's question about a teaching that we recognize as coming from Isaiah, who preached one to two hundred years before Lehi and Sariah left Jerusalem. And Abinadi immediately attributes the priest's lack of understanding of Isaiah's words to their works. They have perverted the ways of the Lord and have not applied their hearts to understanding. Therefore, they have not been wise. And when the priests say that they teach the law of Moses, Abinadi lets them have it. If you teach the law of Moses, why do you not keep it? Why do you set your hearts upon riches? Why do you commit whoredoms and spend your strength with harlots? Yea, and cause this people to commit sin, that the Lord has caused to send me to prophesy against this people. Yea, even a great evil against this people. Know ye not that I speak the truth? Yea, ye know that I speak the truth, and ye ought to tremble before God. And it shall come to pass that ye shall be smitten for your iniquities, for ye have said that ye teach the law of Moses. And what know ye concerning the law of Moses? Now, in my episode on Moses and the law, I argued that there is space to interpret the law of Moses as not promoting polygyny, but rather as attempting to curtail it, and that we should remember that the law of Moses was a lower preparatory law for a people who did not want to come up to meet God themselves. But Abinadi's teachings make it clear that the prophets of the Book of Mormon understood and taught that the law of Moses actually forbids polygyny. Abinadi is drawing straight from Deuteronomy in his condemnation of King Noah and his priests where the law states that kings are forbidden to multiply wives and forbidden to greatly multiply to themselves silver and gold, among a few other restrictions and commandments. And as I mentioned in my episode, Kings Multiply Wives, the Hebrew used here in Deuteronomy for multiply is not primarily used to describe a great increase, as if two to three wives is okay, but 50 is overkill. The Hebrew word used here references an increase which going from one wife to two certainly is. What's so interesting to me about this is that when the Book of Mormon was published in 1830, it was very much believed that the Law of Moses approved of polygyny, and it still is. The Book of Mormon was the first ancient record that witnessed that the Law of Moses forbids polygyny. But with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the mid-20th century came a second witness of this interpretation. I've talked about the Damascus document before, but I want to mention it again because this excavated ancient record harmonizes with the Book of Mormon's interpretation of the Law of Moses, and specifically with Abinadi's condemnation of King Noah and his priests, who were supposed to be wall builders, but instead fell into Satan's traps quoting from the exhortation portion of the Damascus document. They shall be caught in fornication twice by taking a second wife while the first is alive, whereas the principle of creation is male and female created he them. Also, those who entered the ark went in two by two. And concerning the prince, it is written, he shall not multiply wives to himself. This record goes on to explain that King David did not follow that law because it was sealed up he had not read it, which meant he was ignorant of the law. If you're interested in further arguments that polygyny is against the law of Moses, I'm linking in the show notes to a great article written by David Wilbur, who is a Messianic Christian apologist and author. He focused on Leviticus 18.18, which for the sake of time I didn't cover in my episodes on the Old Testament, and he essentially makes a case using the Damascus document that the prohibition against marrying sisters could be a prohibition against polygyny across the board. 
that forbidding a man to marry sisters in this context would refer to the sisterhood of all women, which again is compatible with the Book of Mormon's interpretation of the Law of Moses. It's not surprising, but I feel a little sad that the Damascus document gets more traction among followers of Torah than the Book of Mormon does, at least as evidence that polygyny is forbidden by the Law of Moses. The Book of Mormon is not just for us Gentiles, but for the Jew, that they too may know the covenants of the Lord. Abinadi attempted to get King Noah and the priests to see that they had broken the covenant, that justifying polygamy by prioritizing men's words over God's works was idolatry. And of course, King Noah didn't like that, so he commanded his priests to slay Abinadi. But Abinadi had not delivered his message, nor answered their confusion about the meaning of Isaiah's words, and the people durst not lay their hands on him. For the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and his face shone with exceeding luster, even as Moses' did while in the Mount of Sinai, while speaking with the Lord. And so King Noah's court experienced what it was like to be one of the children of Israel in Moses' day. They got to hear the law of the Lord from a prophet who personally knew what it took to enter the presence of God. In total, Abinadi's preaching stretches over six chapters, so I'm not going into everything, but there's one more teaching that I want to briefly touch upon because it addresses the claim that the Lord may command polygamy to raise up seed. I mentioned this in my detailed breakdown of Jacob 2.30, but I want to mention it again because it's the polygamy of King Noah and his people and consequently their inability to understand the purpose of the law of Moses that prompted Abinadi to go into such a detailed explanation of what the Lord's seed actually means. I don't know Abinadi's exact emotional state when he said this, but I imagine him exasperated, like, how blind can you be? When Isaiah spoke of the Lord's seed, it wasn't to encourage men to impregnate as many women as possible. Raising up seed to the Lord communicates a covenant relationship with the actual Christ, one in which he becomes our father through a spiritual rebirth, that redemption we receive from sin and transgression. The Lord's seed, then, are not biological offspring. They're not babies. They're beings of agency and accountability who have faithfully entered into the covenant. And now what say ye? Abinadi questioned them, speaking of the Lord. And who shall be his seed? Behold, I say unto you that whosoever has heard the words of the prophets, yea, all the holy prophets who have prophesied concerning the coming of the Lord, I say unto you that all those who have hearkened unto their words and believed that the Lord would redeem his people and have looked forward to that day for remission of their sins, I say unto you that these are his seed, for they are the heirs of the kingdom of God. For these are they whose sins he has borne. These are they for whom he has died to redeem them from their transgressions. And now, are they not his seed? Yea, and are not the prophets? Every one that has opened his mouth to prophesy, that has not fallen into transgression, I mean all the holy prophets since the world began, I say unto you that they are his seed. This ridiculous idea that simply siring lots of children is an unequivocal good comes from the natural man which tells us we are carnal beings with carnal needs, and as long as we can financially provide for our carnal needs, then our works are justified. The roots of this philosophy are very old, but the weeds it produces are continuously renewing and always part of our current events. Some men delude themselves into polygamous works as a misdirected act of love and justify it because they are rich. Other men delude themselves into polygamous works as an act of duty, as if they are fulfilling a responsibility to the greater good, and justify it because they are rich. Perhaps this is one of the reasons Christ warned that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. But it's not just worldly men who are vulnerable to this sort of deception. And I want to add, of course, women are vulnerable to this kind of deception as well. And in fact, these things cannot happen without women being complicit. We are all subject to our fallen nature. But Abinadi's words here in verse 13 bring up a hard thing for us to consider. That prophets, too, can fall into transgression. 
It's a little detail, but it's auspiciously placed, as if we are being asked to see in the middle of this extensive explanation of why polygamy is against the commandments, even when priests and kings do it. Look, the Book of Mormon is saying, this can happen. Prophets can transgress the law, so be careful who you follow. Be careful to not just accept the traditions your biological and spiritual fathers passed down. Abinadi was killed for his testimony against King Noah and his priest's works, though interestingly they couldn't get him for that because his teaching of the law of Moses was airtight. They were clearly in violation of the commandments of God. So they killed him because he said that God himself should come down among the children of men. And now I want us to liken these scriptures to ourselves in this dispensation. And before doing so, I want to say that I sincerely have no desire to criticize or judge those who have come before me. My intention is to critically examine the doctrine of many wives and concubines, to determine and frankly to show you why we can have faith that this is not a doctrine of God, but is in fact a doctrine of the devil. So I'm going to examine and compare King Noah and Brigham Young on those terms. And I want to mention why I'm choosing Brigham Young and not Joseph Smith, who Brigham said taught and instituted the doctrine of many wives and concubines. Joseph Smith was accused of this during his lifetime, um, of both introducing this doctrine and of practicing it, but he always denied it. And with the release of the Joseph Smith papers, we now have a great deal of documented evidence that Joseph publicly taught against polygamy with 100% consistency up until his death. He also left behind no physical evidence, such as recorded teachings or a marriage record or a biological child that would conclusively prove that he believed in this doctrine or was a polygamist. Brigham Young, on the other hand, openly believed and taught that the doctrine of many wives and concubines was divine in origin. We have a lot of statements from him on that point recorded and published under the masthead of the church during his lifetime. And more importantly, we have the works that he did with his physical body. He sired some 50-something children um, with 16 different women. So I'm not questioning Brigham's belief that in polygamy. I know he believed it. I'm saying no man's sincere belief can be used to prove something is true. Truth stands on its own, and those who believe in truth are justified by its fruits. So let's briefly examine the fruits of Brigham Young's fervent testimony in polygamy. I'm not talking about the church as a whole, I'm talking about him as an individual. I want to see what kind of man his belief and works turned him into. But first, let's look at King Noah and what his belief system turned him into by examining King Noah's works. He had many wives and concubines. He laid a tax of all they possessed and used it to support himself. King Noah built many elegant and spacious buildings. He placed his heart upon riches. He became a wine-bibber. And because of the wickedness of King Noah and the priests, the people were lifted up in the pride of their hearts, and they did boast and did delight in blood and in the shedding of the blood of their brethren. As you look at this list, I hope you can see that these are the things which give pleasure in the natural world. The Book of Mormon spends a lot of time talking about the natural man, so it shouldn't be surprising that this record showcases a real-world example of the fruit of hearkening to the desires of the natural man. So, using this metric from the Book of Mormon, let's examine the fruits of Brigham Young personally. Brigham Young was sealed to 56 women during his lifetime, and he had children with 16 of those women, so bare minimum, he physically consummated a sexual relationship with at least 16 women as wives or concubines. I know that some people feel like our forefathers didn't have concubines, that Concubines is a distasteful word and isn't commensurate with the status our polygamous foremothers were afforded, to which I would say that's literally the word used in Doctrine and Covenants section 132. And I also want to point out 
an interesting historical tidbit that demonstrates what kind of rights and privileges the quote-unquote wives were given in polygamous Utah. When Brigham Young was 72 years old, he was sued for divorce by a 29-year-old wife, Anna Eliza Webb, on the grounds of neglect, cruel treatment, and desertion. I'm showing images from and linking to the article about this in the Utah Archives and Records. There was a sensational court battle in which Brigham Young claimed that his 1868 marriage to Anna Eliza when he was 67 years old and she was 24 had been in violation of the law and was illegal from the beginning. So he basically said, look, this lady isn't actually married to me. And because of this, there's no legal reason for us to divorce or for me to pay alimony. After some jurisdictional back and forth, the judge ruled that even a marriage in the Mormon tradition of polygamy would qualify for compensation. Brigham Young was ordered to pay the court fees, a monthly alimony, as well as back payments for alimony during the court case. However, he refused to pay. He was arrested and spent the night in jail and was then forced to pay the court fees. He filed an appeal for paying the alimony and a different judge heard that appeal and decided that there was not enough proof of the marriage and therefore alimony could not be demanded. The divorce was finalized in January of 1875. So did Brigham Young have concubines or women with whom he had sexual relations who were not afforded the same status as a wife? According to his own appeal to the courts, he did. As for taxes, Reams of paper have been written on the history of tithing and how that has evolved as the saints navigated that under the governmental structure that we all live within. But I just wanted to point out a specific change that took place immediately after Joseph Smith's death. To give a bit of context, I'm going to read from Stephen Harper's article, The Tithing of My People. After the revelation on tithing was given, which is Doctrine and Covenants section 119, Bishop Partridge wrote to Bishop Whitney in Ohio and explained how it was to be followed. I'm now reading from this article. The saints are required to give all their surplus property into the hands of the Bishop of Zion, and after this first tithing, they are to pay annually one-tenth of all their interest. Bishop Partridge understood one-tenth of all their interest annually to mean 10% of what the saints would earn in interest if they invested their net worth for a year. Shortly after Joseph received the revelation in section 119, he assigned Brigham Young to go among the saints and find out what surplus property the people had, with which to forward the building of the temple we were commencing at Far West. Before setting out, Brigham asked Joseph, Who shall be the judge of what is surplus property? Said he, Let them be the judges themselves. The part I want to particularly highlight is that tithing was to be on all surplus, which, after the initial tithe, was interest. Joseph Smith was killed on June 27, 1844, and the History of the Church, Volume 7, records a brief synopsis of Brigham Young's discourse on Sunday, August 18th, so less than two months later, and it records a change. Brigham said, We shall require the tenth of all your property, as a tithing for the building of the temple, and for the poor and for the priesthood. I want my support and living by the church hereafter, so that I can give my whole time to the business of the church. So tithing or taxing a tenth of all your surplus became a tithe or tax of a tenth of all your property. And whereas, Brigham stated, he had always supported himself, it then became, I want my support and living by the church. I consider this to be a pretty clear match to what King Noah instituted, unfortunately. Next, King Noah built many elegant and spacious buildings. And of course, we know Brigham Young did this, but again, because we love our heritage, we view these buildings as a point of pride and take great care of them. Um, Except, of course, the Gardo House, which is the black and white picture on the right. That house, known as Amelia's Palace for the wife it was built for, was also intended to be used as a governor's mansion, a place where state functions and visiting notables could be entertained. In 1900, it was sold, and then it was demolished in 1927. These buildings on the screen are a fraction of Brigham Young's real estate portfolio. 
The Journal of Discourses includes a proposal Brigham had regarding insurance, how they could all save money by improving the building standards so the saints wouldn't need to insure their buildings. With that context, Brigham Young stated in this discourse, quote, I have about as many buildings as anyone in this territory, end quote. So I don't think there's any argument that Brigham Young built and owned many elegant and spacious buildings. King Noah placed his heart upon riches. Now, I'm not going to make a judgment about Brigham Young's heart. I'm simply going to look at what we know about his finances and leave his heart to God. In the 1870 U.S. Census, Brigham Young reported $2 million in assets and an annual income of $100,000. Now, let me read that again, adjusting those amounts to 2023 U.S. dollars. Brigham Young reported roughly $46.9 million in personal assets and an annual personal income of $2.3 million. Continuing to speak in 2023 U.S. dollars, three years later, in his divorce court case, Annaliza Webb claimed Brigham Young was worth $204.6 million, and had a monthly income of just over $1 million. Brigham Young denied her charges and claimed to have a worth of only $15.4 million and a monthly income of $154,000. Church historian Leonard Arrington said, quote, Brigham Young and the other church authorities, when need required it, drew on the tithing resources of the church and, at a later date, repaid part or all of the obligation in money, property, or services. No interest seems to have been paid for the use of these funds. The ability to draw almost at will on church as well as his own funds was a great advantage to Brigham Young and was certainly one of the reasons for his worldly success. End quote. One visitor to the territory wrote, Brigham Young is undoubtedly the richest man in the Western Hemisphere, even richer perhaps than any single member of the Rothschild family. King Noah became a wine bibber. He planted vineyards and built wine presses and made wine in abundance. In Brigham Young's life, we see a parallel. In 1856, his biography, The Lion of the Lord, reports, He received a freight of six tons of tobacco, rum, whiskey, brandy, tea, and coffee. In 1861, he had a winery established in Tokerville, which is in southern Utah, and he also built a whiskey distillery at the mouth of Parley's Canyon. He received frequent shipments of 40-gallon barrels of port, and he owned Salt Lake City's first saloon. So again, we have justifications for this. Brigham himself said, quote, When there was no whiskey to be had here and we needed it for rational purposes, I built a house to make it in, end quote. But nonetheless, the Book of Mormon cautions us against this sort of work. And finally, just as the wickedness of King Noah and his priests caused his people to delight in blood and the shedding of the blood of their brethren, Latter-day Saints in Utah committed one of the most shocking massacres in our nation's history on September 7, 1857, after imbibing at least five years of very heavy polygamy indoctrination and the violent rhetoric of blood atonement. The new book by Richard Turley and Barbara Jones Brown, Vengeance is Mine, draws on previously unused archival records and new transcriptions of shorthand documents from John D. Lee's trials from the Mountain Meadows Massacre to demonstrate how the doctrine of blood atonement, as well as other factors, like, in my opinion, polygamy, created an environment where members could have misconstrued those teachings into justification for murder. In one sermon delivered in the Salt Lake Tabernacle on February 8, 1857, so just months before the massacre, Brigham Young taught in a long discourse on this topic, so this is just one of many possible demonstrative quotes. Quote, This is loving our neighbor as ourselves. If he needs help, help him. And if he wants salvation, and it is necessary to spill his blood on the earth in order that he may be saved, spill it. End quote. 
In 2010, the church released a statement that so-called quote-unquote blood atonement, by which individuals would be required to shed their own blood to pay for their own sins, is not a doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So, happily, we have fully rejected this doctrine. Nonetheless, this was a very well-recorded teaching of Brigham Young, and the people he taught this to did shed the blood of their brethren, both at the individual's request as a blood atonement and unbidden as murder. The last similarity is not listed on this table, but both of these men believed that these works were approved by God. I'm not questioning their beliefs or testimonies, and I'm not doing this series to say our leaders knew they were breaking God's commandments and did it anyway. I have no idea what they knew, and it makes me sad to make this comparison. This has been a really difficult episode for me to make because I don't like marinating in this but I'm doing it because I've gained a witness through my faith in the living God and God's only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that polygamy does not come from God. And I want to help us see that a great deal of our painful Latter-day Saint history does not need to be justified as God's mysterious ways. Our own Book of Mormon warns us that this is what a polygamous system turns men into. At least, This is what men at the top of a polygamous system become. This is the fruit of the doctrine of many wives and concubines, to say nothing of what this does to women and children. Now in the story of Abinadi and King Noah, there was a young man named Alma who believed the words which Abinadi spoke, for he knew concerning the iniquity which Abinadi had testified against them. The king ordered Alma's execution, but Alma fled, and he repented of his sins and his iniquities. Later, Alma reminded his people of their awful oppression and listened to his experience. Quote, Remember the iniquity of King Noah and his priests, and I myself was caught in a snare and did many things which were abominable in the sight of the Lord, which caused me sore repentance. Nevertheless, after much tribulation, the Lord did hear my cries and did answer my prayers, and has made me an instrument in his hands in bringing so many of you to a knowledge of his truth. And now Alma was their high priest, he being the founder of their church. And it came to pass that none received authority to preach or to teach, except it were given him by God. End quote. And this right here, this scripture is our hope, for it tells us that priesthood authority can be held by one who has committed abominations when he repents. The scriptures don't say if Alma was initially ordained with priesthood authority and he retained it, or if he lost it through his works and it was restored to him, or if he received it for the very first time after his repentance. And clearly for members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, our story is different because our polygamous leaders are gone, but chunks of the doctrine remain. Though I do want to note that this story could be taking place right now with any of our brothers in the polygamous offshoot branches of the Restoration. They may actually have an easier time changing their minds than many of us, for like Alma, they know concerning this iniquity, whereas many of us imagine ways in which polygamy might be a gift and a blessing. But I've seen many people in the church hit just an intellectual wall about polygamy because they assume that if it was wrong, If polygamy is a sin and an abomination, then the church today has no authority. And that's just unthinkable for them because that doesn't check out with their personal spiritual experiences within the church. Alma's story shows us that Christ will delight to answer our prayers on this issue. And if repentance is needed, whatever repentance may be needed, it can be done. Whether we've had any Almas in the leadership of our church is perhaps only for God to say. But I want to point out something very significant that President Gordon B. Hinckley said in his 1998 interview with Larry King. When polygamy came up, as he knew it would, and you may remember how diligently President Hinckley was reported to have prepared for that interview, so there's every indication that he said what he intended to say. When polygamy came up, they had a back and forth, and Larry King couldn't quite pin him down on his personal view of it until he said, speaking of polygamy, you condemn it, 
to which President Hinckley answered, I condemn it, yes, as a practice, because I think it is not doctrinal. Not doctrinal. Those are very powerful words to use. Just about the most powerful statement a man can make as the president of the church. We always say, policy can change. Procedure can change. But doctrine is eternal, unchanging truth. And that day, the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints declared that there is no doctrine of many wives and concubines. The other very powerful word that has been used in recent years regarding another one of Brigham Young's public teachings is disavow. So there is precedent here. It can be extremely disorienting to consider that polygamy has always been a sin and will always be a sin because it goes against the tradition of many of our Latter-day Saint fathers. But I am thankful that our current leaders have shown that they're open to re-examining our long-held traditions. I'm thankful that President Nelson pled with the women of the church to share our insights, our impressions, and our inspiration, and that he now invites all of us to think celestial. It means the leaders of the church today value women's perspective and that they have confidence that God can and will reveal to all of us the eternal laws that govern the celestial realm. When the apostles in Jesus' day saw him walking upon the water, they were scared. It shattered their preconceived notions and their understanding of the way things worked. But their feelings of confusion and fear were not evidence that what they saw was wrong and bad. It was Christ. For all of us sailing on the good ship Zion, we have no reason to step outside that boat of belief unless we see something out there on the water that makes us afraid, that upends our understanding of the way things work. When we see something like that, if we close our eyes in fear and cover our ears like this is not happening, we may miss the very Son of God. Let's learn from Peter, who called out, Lord, if it is you, bid me come to you. If that light out there which makes us confused and afraid is Christ, he will say, come. And when we start to sink, he will help us. Thinking celestial means being willing to shed whatever binds us to this fallen world, whether it be material or mental. It means prioritizing Christ's works and words above all others. Christ taught that the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. Rather than attempt to disentangle the good from the bad, the householder told his servants to let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. This is the time when the Lord has said, the field is white, all ready to harvest, and faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye single to the glory of God, qualify us for the work. Ask, and ye shall receive. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So, what should we ask for in this time of harvest? Well, if we want to think celestial, we must know whether having many wives and concubines is an eternal principle and doctrine of God or of the devil. So one of the first things we should ask and believe that we can receive an answer from God about is polygamy. Is it wheat or is it a tear? It cannot be both. 